Welcome back. Chapter 7 of Don Quixote, Part 1, opens with a narrative interruption that Cervantes will deploy again and again throughout the rest of the novel, with symbolic, political, and moral implications. We can admit that this technique is convenient and that the author perhaps uses it for its own sake, or simply because he wants to change his narrative focus. Okay, but I suspect a purely pragmatic explanation is too easy. When we do literature, by which I mean when we analyze a text in a professional manner, it's always a good strategy to consider how a text's form reflects its function. In other words, how its structure complements its message, and vice versa. Throughout Don Quixote, these disturbing disorientations will indicate that the text is an artificial construction, thus requiring some meaningful reflection on our part. For example, when confronted by Cervantes' narrative breaks, it is hard not to think of Freud, not literally as if Cervantes were a Freudian, but in reverse fashion, as if Cervantes anticipated Freud's theories. His symbolic emphasis on water, his intimations on the repressed sexuality of his characters, and above all, his utilization of dreams, both dreams that interrupt narratives and dreams that are themselves interrupted by narratives, are ideas popularized by Freud centuries later. And we know for a fact that Freud read Cervantes. Consider that precisely in the context of the random rescue of the tears of Angelica from the flames, our hero wakes up as if from a nightmare. At this point, Don Quixote began to cry out, and this accompanies another slap at the Inquisition. By attending to this noise and ruckus, the scrutiny of the remaining books went no further, and so it is believed that into the flames they went, without being seen or heard. Perhaps if the priest had seen to them, they would not have suffered such a severe sentence. This time, however, the books that get burned refer to the recent reign of Charles V. We must remember this when we contemplate the novel's political implications. This is because the lifestyle, the ideology, the very ethos, if you will, of the chivalric myth reached its zenith in mid-16th century Europe. Under the Emperor Charles V of Spain and King Henry II of France, the latter died after being wounded in a jousting tournament. It was national courts that fueled an aesthetic derived from the very chivalric romances that Cervantes' novel mocks. Notice that, awakening from his dream at the beginning of chapter 7, Don Quixote praises valiant knights, valerosos caballeros, and dismisses more domesticated courtly gentlemen, caballeros cortesanos. In other words, our hero identifies with a medieval ideal over and against its corruption at modern courts. Meanwhile, Don Quixote's health remains front and center, for that bastard Don Roland has cudgeled me with the trunk of an oak tree and all out of envy because he sees that I alone oppose his might. There follows another strong identification between Don Quixote and Reinaldos de Montalban. We will consider the logic of this identification in future chapters. And Cervantes continues his criticism of the Inquisition, as if to say, not like this. Many books must have burned which deserve to be stored in perpetual archives, but this was disallowed according to their fate and the laziness of the examiner. And so they fulfilled the old saying that sometimes the innocent pay for the sins of the guilty. Two days later, they've sealed off access to the room where Don Quixote kept his books, and the poor man thinks he is hallucinating. The housekeeper and niece in particular try to calm him down, inventing a story to explain his library's disappearance. Personally, this scene has always impressed me with its pathos. He came to where the door used to be, and he felt about with his hands, and his eyes looked all around without saying a word. But after a while, he asked his housekeeper which part of the house contained the room with his books. She tells Don Quixote that his library was taken away by the devil himself. But the niece, with more empathy, invents a story that accords with his madness. She cites a wizard who came one night on a cloud, and Don Quixote takes the bait. This wizard knows, according to his arts and books, that I shall, in time, come to fight in single combat a knight whom he favors and who I am destined to vanquish. The niece's response anticipates, by a century and a half, the pessimism of Voltaire, who at the end of his very quixotic novel, Candide, says that it would be better if, instead of exploring the world, we all stayed home and tended to our own garden. Anise asks her uncle, 
Would it not be better to remain at peace at home and not roam around the world in a quest for bread made from perfect wheat, never considering that many who go seeking wool come back shorn? Don Quixote replies with ominous anger, I'll pluck and remove the beards of all who imagine they can touch even one of my whiskers. In preparation for the second sally, Cervantes introduces us to Sancho Panza. He is both simple and poor, a neighboring farmer, a good man if that title can be given to someone who is poor, but short on dwangs in his noggin, and the poor villager agreed to go forth with him and serve as his squire. Don Quixote seduces him, explaining that they might win some island of which he would make him governor. This will be the main motivation for almost everything Sancho Panza does or says throughout the remainder of the novel. At the same time, we note that Don Quixote continues to mismanage his household. At least now he knows he will need money, so he sells stuff and borrows, albeit ineptly hawking one thing and pawning another, all for less than he should have. He came up with a reasonable amount. In addition, Cervantes begins to associate Sancho with the ass theme. He intended to bring along an ass, which he held in high esteem because he was not inclined to walk great distances. The difficulties, jokes, and puns surrounding this beast are often hilarious. As for the ass, Don Quixote had to think about that one for a while, trying to recall if any knight had ventured forth with a squire mounted assishly. Once prepared, even with shirts and saddlebags following the advice the innkeeper had given to him, Don Quixote and Sancho set out over the fields of Montiel. Sancho emphasizes the theme of his future governorship of an island. I'll know how to rule it, no matter how large. And Don Quixote considers a range of social statuses that lie in the squire's future. He may soon be a count, marquis, or even a king. Here Sancho hesitates. Perhaps it's better that Teresa, or is her name Juana, or Mari Gutierrez, Sancho's wife, be a contessa instead of a queen. But Don Quixote insists, don't sell yourself so short that you're content with anything less than frontier governor. This fantasized future, full of titles and wealth, suggests that the romances of chivalry stoked the minds of the conquistadors.